why does the length of the day on Saturn change over time? And it relates to some work that I've carried out for my thesis. And uh, yeah, I'm basically here to tell you all about it. So this um, presentation will be split up into four sections. In the first little mini area, I'll talk about myself and how I've got to where I am today. I'll then talk about Saturn itself. So a brief intro to the planet, um, what we know about it, what we don't know, at least not everything. Uh, and then I'll go into more detail about the study that we did and how we produced the result that uh, was able to address this question. And then that will all be wrapped up by a brief look at the future and uh, indeed sort of some closing remarks from myself, okay? So hold on tight, um, away we go. So uh, yeah, this is something that I should probably um, just get off my chest <laughs> to begin with. So um, I'm a 27 year old British Bangladeshi. I was born in Oldham in Greater Manchester, um, but I've lived in Leicester practically all my life. So I should point out that right now um, I am in my office at the University of Leicester. Um, and yeah, it's, it's pretty much the end of the day. There's no one around. Uh, so yeah, we've got the building to ourselves basically. Okay, um, anyway moved to Leicester and then I attended uh, primary school in Leicester between 1999 and 2006. When I was at primary school, I loved to read books. Okay, that, that was me. Uh, you'd find me during playtime, um, dinner time, even just reading books. Darren Shan, Harry Potter, Horrible Histories, uh, Horrible Science and so on. After primary school, of course, I went to secondary school and again stayed in Leicester. Uh, and I, when it came to picking my GCSE options, I picked geography, business studies, and psychology. And those three subjects I picked because I was interested in them. They don't necessarily have any bearing on what I do in the present day. Um, after secondary school, I went to a sixth form, again in Leicester, uh, the Wigaston and Queen Elizabeth I College. And I was there for a couple of years, studied physics, mathematics, and further mathematics at A level. What were my grades? I got A for maths, B for physics, and C for further maths. Okay, so my grades weren't necessarily outstanding, but they were enough to get me into the University of Leicester to study on a four year uh, master's degree, physics with, ast with astrophysics. Um, and during this time, I decided that I would like, quite like to do a PhD after I graduated. And so come 2017, um, I'd been applying for PhD projects up and down the country. I think I applied to six different places, um, but the only place where I got an offer from was Leicester. Uh, and so I stayed on in Leicester. It only takes one, you know, you can apply to everywhere you like. It only takes one offer uh, in order to realize your ambition. Okay. Um, and so I've been doing my PhD since 2017. I've only very recently submitted my thesis and the title of my thesis was Saturn's aurora, ionosphere, and thermosphere. Okay, um, I guess outside of education, I do, I love getting involved with outreach work. So I've held a number of voluntary and paid part-time positions over the years. Um, so I've worked at the National Space Center in the past in Leicester. And as Patricia mentioned at the top, I did used to work very briefly at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich for a year. Um, I still consider it the best place I've ever worked. It's just a beautiful location. And I do miss working there, I must say. Um, but for understandable reasons, I couldn't really carry it on beyond um, a year because of sort of the travel costs involved and uh, so on. Okay, um, and in my spare time, just to round this off, um, I do like to read newspapers, uh, play football occasionally, go to the gym and just generally surf the web, uh, YouTube and so on. Um, and my ambition is to become a full-time researcher in planetary science, okay? Right, oh, felt like I've been talking for ages. Anyway, uh, this is where we now go into the talk proper, okay? Uh, so let's go straight into Saturn. And I've created a small profile here, okay? So Saturn is the sixth planet from the sun, and it's the second largest in our solar system after Jupiter. So Saturn is what we call a gas giant, which means that it is made of gas, basically. Um, and it has really short days. So if you're measuring it in hours and minutes, 
one day on Saturn takes about 10 hours and 42 minutes, okay? So very quick compared with the Earth's 23 hours and 56 minutes or so. Um, and secondly, Saturn has really long years. So the time it takes to orbit the sun for Saturn is around about 29 years, right? I'm 27. Um, in two years time, uh, I guess that will mark uh, one journey of Saturn around the sun um, uh, from when I was born. Anyway, uh, and lastly, the atmosphere of Saturn is dominated by neutral hydrogen and helium, which is why we call it a gas giant. So when you're at the Earth, it's brilliant. You step outside and you're on solid ground. If you were on Saturn and you decided to step outside, you'd go straight through because, well, it's just gas. Okay, there isn't a solid surface. It's got a solid core. But the surface, what we see in our observations is purely uh, gaseous in nature. So this um, little section is split up into three further sections. In the first, I'll be going over the story of the discovery of Saturn and then looking at the rotation rate, which is kind of what my talk relates to in the main sense. Uh, and then I'll also touch briefly on the aurora or the northern lights, okay? So the discovery of Saturn, and this really is where our story begins. Saturn has been known to exist since prehistoric times. And it was first observed with a telescope by this gentleman right here, Galileo Galilei, Italian astronomer. Um, and he built a telescope in 1609. It was very crude, okay? Not using the modern technology that we have available to us. Um, but in 1610, he decided to pointed at what we what was known back then as the star of Saturn. Okay, Saturn was not known to be a planet. And what I've got here is um, a snapshot of a letter that Galileo wrote to a leading diplomat of the time. Okay, and in this letter, he describes a three-bodied Saturn. Okay, so he says, the star of Saturn is not one alone but is composed of three, which almost touch one another, nor do they ever move or change position among themselves. The one in the middle is about three times larger than the two at the sides. And he actually drew this, okay, in his uh, letter. You can see it there in the oval, right in the center. You've got a body in the middle, and then you've got two on the side, okay? And he thought that Saturn was not a star on its own, but it was actually made up of three distinct parts. Okay, um, this story then takes a bit of a twist when in 1659, you get the Dutch astronomer, Christian Huygens, okay, who using slightly better technology in terms of telescope, basically his telescope was a bit better. He realized that actually what's, what Galileo saw and thought was three different bodies was actually one planet, okay? In fact, he drew out his own observations um, and he published this work, okay? So this is what he said. So Huygens explained that Galileo, Galileo's three-bodied Saturn was actually surrounded by a ring, which was thin and flat. It wasn't touching anymore, uh, anywhere, sorry, and it was inclined to the ecliptic, okay? And this is the illustration that he produced. And what he suggested was the reason why Galileo would have seen three different parts was because his telescope wasn't good enough to be able to just make out the rings, okay? And the rings were the two little edge pieces uh, sandwiching the larger central body. And Huygens himself was incredibly talented and he suggested that the reason why you don't see the rings is because sometimes the planet is inclined towards uh, sorry, the way we look at it, we see the rings inclined towards us and then they sort of tilt away from us and there's that cycle. And so there might have been a point where Galileo would have looked at Saturn and seen the rings disappear. Okay, but then he would have thought that uh, they were just two extra bodies on the side. Okay, um, I guess the last major discovery for Saturn in terms of the observational astronomy side of things was made by the Italian French astronomer Jean Dominique Cassini, okay, who discovered a division in the rings of Saturn in 1675. And this became known as the Cassini division. So here it is, you can see Saturn's rings and 
the rings are effectively split into two. Okay, you've got an outer ring and an inner ring, and in between these, you've got this division, which is what we now know as uh, which, what we now call the Cassini division. Um, while I was putting this together, I did find a video actually, which simulates the view that Cassini would have had through his telescope back in 1675. And you can see there's a very faint division perhaps. And it's, it's amazing that you can actually produce this kind of material, but that just gives you a sense of what the kind of view that Cassini would have had back then when he made that discovery of the division in the rings, okay? Now, if we come forward, um, a few hundred years, and we're exploring Saturn in the modern day and age. Pioneer 11 was the first spacecraft to encounter the Saturnian system in 1979, okay? So what it did was it performed a series of flybys of both the planet and its moons. Here is an artist's impression of this Pioneer 11 spacecraft. Um, it was launched in the 70s and it reached Saturn in 1979. And here's an example of an image that it was able to take at the time. So comparing this image with what I had on my background, you can see that there's quite a stark difference, okay? Um, but this wasn't the only spacecraft at the time to fly by Saturn, okay? We also had the Voyager 1 and 2 spacecraft, which also performed flybys in 1980 and 1981, respectively. Again, they took images of the rings and the upper atmosphere of Saturn, okay? And then what really revolutionized our understanding of the planetary system for Saturn was the Cassini-Huygens spacecraft, okay? And this was launched um, at the back end of the 90s. It reached Saturn in 2004, and then it just orbited the planet over and over and over again for about 13 years, okay? packed with instruments, and these instruments led to numerous discoveries about the planetary system. Um, and, you know, we're looking now at a very detailed view of Saturn, which is afforded to us by the Cassini spacecraft. And just the summary of the mission itself, we've got the Cassini mission that, well, this is an artist's impression of the spacecraft itself. Um, and it just gives you an example, a sense of what it achieved really. You had 27 nations participating in this mission, um, over 3,950 science papers published, 294 orbits of Saturn completed, and lots and lots of data, 635 gigabytes of science data collected. So an absolutely fascinating mission, and it did come to an end in 2017 when um, the team of scientists controlling it from the Earth decided to crash it into the upper atmosphere of Saturn. Okay, so that's um, a quick look at the exploration of Saturn, the discovery of Saturn before that as well. Let's now take a closer look at the rotation rate, okay, because this is the crux of this lecture. So the length of a day on Saturn does change, okay, it has been known to change as well. So just a brief bit of intro, how do we actually measure the rotation rate of a planet? Well. If you want to measure the length of a day on a rocky planet, a terrestrial planet, it's fairly easy, okay? You pick a surface feature and you track how long it takes for that surface feature to rotate out of view and then back into view, okay? So for example, if you wanted to measure the rotation rate on Mars, okay? Fancy doing an experiment, why not? Get a strong enough, large enough telescope and you've got a number of surface features here that you can pick out. You might go with Olympus Mons, which is the uh, largest mountain in the solar system, or you might go for the Southern Polar Cup if you fancy a bit of a challenge. But the key thing here is you can pick a solid feature um, from any one of these, and you will be able to see the planet rotate, and these features will rotate out of view, and then eventually they'll reappear, okay, as the planet sort of completes its rotation on its axis. And if you time how long it takes for one of these features to go from a starting point all the way around to the start point again, that's effectively one day on the planet. However, for a gas giant planet like Saturn or even Jupiter, this method of picking a surface feature and tracking how long it takes to rotate into and out of view again, um, doesn't really work so well, okay? And that's because 
strictly speaking, there aren't any surface features. When we're observing a planet like Jupiter or Saturn, all we see is top of the atmosphere, okay? And the rotation rate of a planet without surface features like Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune can only be reliably tracked um, using radio emissions. So as the planet rotates, um, you get kind of a lighthouse effect, where as the planet rotates, you get boop, a radio emission, boop, another radio emission, and so on. And you can track those and estimate how long a day on the planet is. Now, I've got this video here. Uh, you might recognize the YouTuber, uh, Dr. Becky Smethurst. Um, and uh, I'm just gonna play this for a couple of minutes because she actually gives a really good intro, uh, an overview of this problem. So I'm gonna be quiet for a sec. Last year, I made a video all about how we don't know how long a day is on Saturn. I, we don't know how long it takes Saturn to fully rotate on its axis. But now we think we do. So as a quick summary of this problem, it is notoriously difficult to measure the rotation rate of the gas giants because unlike for the rocky planets, there's no fixed objects on the surface that you can pick to time how long it takes to come back round to the same spot because everything is just, you know, swirling around in the thick gas atmosphere in, in the same way that sort of clouds move around in Earth's atmosphere. Instead, what we do is we use the radio emission that's given off by electrons trapped in the magnetic field of the planet. And that radio emission as the planet rotates essentially beams like a lighthouse. And this is the same process that produce a lot of the aurora on planets as well. The problem for Saturn is that the measurement that Voyager took back in 1980 and the measurement from Cassini in 2005 differed by six whole minutes. And in my previous video, I talked about how unlikely it was that the real actual rotation rate of like the inside of Saturn had actually changed by six minutes because it's really difficult to slow a planet's rotation down like that. You would need an incredibly large force to slow it down that much in that short space of a time. Instead, it was probably something to do with the measurement. And in my previous video, I said there's three things that could explain this. Either the Voyager and Cassini measurements were wrong in some way, but they've been looked at many, many times and people can't find anything wrong with it or it really did change by six minutes, which we just heard wasn't likely, or three, that there's some new science here that we don't yet understand. Now there's lots of different ideas, hypotheses been floating around for decades since that Cassini mission with the six minute difference first came in. And one of the ones that I talked about in my previous video was this idea that Saturn's moon Enceladus, which has these huge geysers of water that are fired off from sort of like grand- Right, um, I'm gonna just, get out of that video there. Okay. Back force oh, on oh. what- Thank you, Becky, um, that, that'll do. Uh, yeah, so what that should have um, highlighted was the fact that we use radio emissions to uh, measure the rotation rate of a gas giant planet, okay? And that little numbered bullet list, uh, numbered list that Becky um, presented there, she said either that um, the change in Saturn's rotation rate um, as measured from Voyager versus the measurement from Cassini of six minutes is either down to um, dodgy maths at the time or uh, that the planetary rotation rate had indeed actually changed, but that's largely unlikely, okay? Uh, or that there's new science involved, okay? Something that we don't know, uh, we haven't known in the past. So, um, uh, yeah, so I've just highlighted here now, again, we've got a difference of six minutes between the measurements taken by Voyager and the measurements from Cassini. So you've got 1980, the rotation rate of Saturn using radio emission was found to be around about 10 hours and 39 minutes. But then using Cassini data from 2004, um, we've got a difference, it's 10 hours and 45 minutes now, okay? So uh, more about that in just a moment, um, but I would now quite like to focus on the Aurora, okay? Uh, you'll see me, flicking my head this way a lot. That's because I've got a, a clock here, which I'm using to uh, time myself. I'll just put that back down again, don't wanna drop it. Um, anyway, uh, the aurora. So when we think about the Northern Lights or the aurora at Earth, okay, we might be able to conjure up an image like this in our, in our minds, okay? So the way it goes, any planet or moon that possesses a magnetic field and a source of energetic charged particles into its atmosphere, is capable of producing aurora, okay? And we do see that at the Earth, 
the Aurora Borealis or the Northern Lights, and then we've also got the Aurora Australis, which are the Southern Lights, okay? So the way these are created, you have these energetic charged particles, which are trapped in the Earth's um, magnetosphere, which is the region of the planet's surrounding environment, which is dominated by the magnetic field strength. Okay, so you've got these energetic charged particles, they accelerate along a planet's magnetic field lines into the polar regions, okay, of the atmosphere, where they then encounter neutral atoms. And so you've got these energetic charged particles flying in at high speed, and you've got neutral atoms like oxygen, uh, nitrogen, and then when they collide slash interact, the energy that's released is visualized in the form of the aurora, okay? Um, I've got a couple of graphics here which uh, illustrate this point a little bit better than perhaps my two fists. Um, anyway, so we've got the sun and then we've got the earth on this side. Of course, this is not to scale, um, but you've got the sun emitting a lot of material, uh, energetic charged particles. In this case, we're calling them solar particles. And these travel through space in all directions. Um, and when they reach the earth's magnetosphere, they get trapped. Okay. And then once they find themselves really close to the Earth, they are accelerated by the Earth's magnetic field lines into the polar regions. And at the polar regions, in this case, the northern polar cap, you've got these electrons from the sun, solar charged particles, interacting or colliding with neutral atoms such as oxygen and nitrogen to generate emission. And this emission are the aurora, the northern lights. And you get different colors in the northern lights, depending on the altitude at which these interactions occur. Now, that, that's the aurora at the Earth, but we do also get auroral emissions at Saturn, at Jupiter. We even get them at Uranus, okay? So focusing on Saturn for just a moment. So the aurora at Saturn are created through the same process. You've got energetic charged particles interacting with neutral hydrogen in this case in the upper atmosphere of Saturn. Um, the key difference with the Earth is that uh, the source of charged particles now is the icy moon Enceladus. So Saturn is a lot further away from the Sun than the Earth is and so you don't get as much solar particles at Saturn than, as, as you would at Earth um, but instead the substitute source is this icy moon natural satellite Enceladus Enceladus on its surface has these uh, geysers, okay, or geysers if you prefer it to be pronounced in that way. And what these do is they eject icy material, charged particles into uh, the local Saturn environment. And then these particles, charged particles, then get trapped in um, Saturn's magnetic field lines. Uh, and then they are accelerated along the field lines into the polar regions to produce the aurora at Saturn. So yes, um, the emissions at Saturn can be studied from the Earth, which is what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And they can also be observed in situ. What, I'm, what I mean by that is, if you send a spacecraft into the Saturnian system, um, you can use instruments on board to take observations from the planet itself effectively. Okay, and these aurora have been investigated across the entire range of the electromagnetic spectrum. Here are some pretty pictures. So this is the uh, infrared aurora of Saturn. So this is all in the infrared wavelength, allows us to work out temperatures and indeed intensities. Um, we also have measurements in the visible wavelength. Keep in mind though, that the visible aurora can only be seen at night. So for this, to take a visible picture of the aurora, you couldn't do it from Earth because whenever we look at Saturn, we only see the day side. This can only be taken from the planet itself. So if you have a spacecraft orbiting and going around to the night side of the planet, you can snap a picture like this, okay? Uh, we also have images of the aurora in the ultraviolet um, taken using the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, and last but not least, we also have X-ray emissions. So very high energy um, observations and uh, these can be taken using space-based telescopes, okay? Arguably the most important thing for infrared aurora is this um, little graphic here. So 
This is an artist's impression of H3+, which is an ion that is found in the upper atmospheres of all the gas giant planets, including Jupiter and Uranus, which is, I guess, technically speaking, it's a, um, an ice giant. Yes, I was just looking for that word there, ice, yeah. Anyway, um, so the way H3 plus is created, H3 plus, you have neutral hydrogen, H2, um, and then you've got, you've got these energetic charged particles coming in and interacting with the neutral hydrogen to produce a hydrogen ion, H2 plus, and you've got two spare electrons. H2 plus then reacts with neutral H2 hydrogen to produce H3 plus. And when we take infrared observations um, of Saturn's aurora, what we're actually measuring is the emission from H3 plus, this absolutely brilliant, really handy, useful uh, ion in Saturn's upper atmosphere. Right, so um, where does that leave us? Well, we know that the rotation rate of Saturn appears to have changed. We're not sure why that is. People have ideas, but again, uh, not many, um, uh, not much evidence, let's say. And we know that the aurora can play a part in the rotation rate of Saturn changing. And that's the bit which I want to come on to next, okay? So part three, solving a mystery. Here we go, uh, a bit of text. Um, I hope it doesn't put you off. But anyway, what it says is we now know for sure that, yeah, the length of a day on Saturn seems to be changing, but we're not entirely sure why. Some of the best planetary scientists all around the world have grappled with this problem, okay? Ever since the Cassini measurements from 2004, which revealed this change in the rotation rate, people have been trying to understand why, okay? And so lots of people come up with lots of different theories. That's the way science works. You're not sure why something is. You're trying to explain it, so you come up with a theory, an idea. Um, the trouble is that a lot of these theories are difficult to test and or they don't have the observational data to back them up, okay? So this is where our study comes in. Um, so I'm going to go through the motivation for why we took on the study that we did. Uh, and then we'll talk about the observations followed by the data analysis and then the key findings, okay? So let's dive right into the motivation for the study. So as I've already mentioned, painstaking theoretical and computer modeling work over the years has led to ideas about why Saturn's rotation rate could be changing. And we are now finally in a position where we can test some of these theories, okay? Through observations of the infrared aurora. So what we did was we focused on predictions that were linked to how ions in Saturn's atmosphere would be expected to move based on two different theories. So in plain speak, we've got the infrared aurora. When we're measuring the infrared aurora, we're tracking the motion of H3 plus ions, so this hydrogen ion. And we decided that we would take two main theories and see whether the ions behaved in a way that was predicted by the two different theories. Okay, so again, the observations of the aurora, specifically the velocity of the ions would allow us to test these two theories. So um, I should probably provide a bit of context. So here's an image, or well, it's not necessarily an image, it's, it's a, an impression again of the different electric uh, planetary currents that we have at Earth, okay? And you can see it's a very, very convoluted view. There's a lot going on, um, yeah. I guess the less that we spend on this, the better. The key thing here is that you've got lots of electric currents that are generated by the planet alongside the magnetic field. Uh, and these all have an effect on uh, what we see, uh, especially with the aurora and just generally behavior of the planet itself. Um, we got a similar system for Saturn, okay? Saturn's magnetosphere as illustrated here. Um, you've got the magnetic field of the planet coming out from the top of the pole, and then that sort of extends back into uh, the magneto tail as you go further downstream of the planet. Um, and yeah, again, you've got lots of different natural satellites. One of those is a key source of energetic charged particles, okay? So observing techniques have been used in the past at Jupiter to produce infrared maps 
of the Aurora. Okay, so this is work carried out by um, one of my collaborators, Rosie Johnson, who's now based at Aberystwyth in Wales. Um, and she's used data in the past, which has relied on VLT, very large telescope observations of Jupiter to produce these maps of the Aurora. You've got the auroral emission intensities in the top half there. And in the bottom half, you've got the velocities of the H3 plus ions, okay? And so this is a technique now that we were looking to apply to Saturn using Keck, which is one of the most powerful telescopes on Earth. And what we were testing were these two different theories. So if the rotation rate changes at Saturn were driven by the magnetosphere, we would expect to see the ions flow uh, in an anti-clockwise sense if you're looking at the right side of the planet, oh, sorry, the left side, the dawn side. Okay, so where you've got this little 90, uh, you'd expect the ions to flow in this direction. However, if there happened to be something in the planet's atmosphere, which was driving the changes in the rotation rate of the planet, then you would expect to see the uh, ions flowing in a clockwise direction on this dawn side of the planet, and it's mirrored on the other side, okay? So these are the two views that we're testing. We've got driven by the magnetosphere, that's one of the theories, and then the other theory is that these changes in the rotation rate are driven by something going on in the thermosphere. We'll come back to that graphic in just a moment. Um, before we do that though, let's talk about the observations. So um, this, uh, these observations taken for this study were carried out before I arrived in my position as a PhD student, June, July, and August of 2017. So I missed the boat by about a month as I started in September, 2017. Um, but anyway, my supervisor, Tom Stallard, he was the one who went out to Hawaii to carry out, take these observations. And he observed Saturn using Keck over the course of several nights um, during that summer. And magnetic field data from the Cassini spacecraft were also used in this study, okay? So this is an image of the two Keck domes. You've also got another observatory in the background there. Um, but the view that we have here is from the summit or near the summit of Mauna Kea in Hawaii. It's absolutely gorgeous. You've got a sunset there. Um, if you look between the two telescope domes, you'll be able to see uh, a distant island. So one of the islands in the Hawaiian chain of islands. Um, and I'm very fortunate to say that I was able to take this picture myself during an observing trip back in 2018. Anyway, um, so my supervisor's there in 2017 and he's observing Saturn. So this is what the image from Keck looks like on the night. Um, you can see a line that goes across the top of the pole. Okay, and that's the instrument slit, the instrument which allows us to take spectra of the aurora. And on the right side here, you can see what these exposures look like. You've got a band on the left and the right. These are the rings, okay, the reflected sunlight from the rings. And then you've got an emission line in the middle, and that's the emission line that we're getting from H3+. Plus. Okay. And this data is collected on spectra. So here is an example of a spectrum in one of the orders of wavelength. And then you've got another one down here as well. So again, you've got reflected sunlight from the rings along the top and the bottom. You've got some reflected sunlight from the planet itself. And then this here, this beautiful emission line, Q1, that's the Q1 emission line of H3+. Okay? You also have a R2 emission line. Don't worry too much about these emission lines. The point is that H3 plus is energetic enough to produce emission, which we can then observe using a spectral instrument and we get these spectra, okay? Now, um, the data were collected over the course of nine different nights. Have I got nine nights on there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Does that look like 10? That looks like 10 to me. Okay, oh wait, sorry. Uh, one of those is a duplicate of the other. So it is nine different dates, yes. And using these, observations, we can produce maps of the aurora a bit like this. So the left-hand column is showing the auroral emission. The middle column is showing you the sunlight reflected from the surface of the planet itself. And then on the right side, you've got the reflected sunlight from the rings. And if you put all of those three together, you'll get an image of the planet as a whole in infrared, okay? Right, let's uh, pick up the pace a little bit. So we are now, 
at the stage where we've got our data, we've processed it, we've cleaned it down, um, and we're now going to investigate these two theories and see if we can work out which of them, if there is one, which dominates our data, okay? So once we've got our data, they're ready to be analyzed. Using the time at which these data were taken, we can work out the northern planetary magnetic phase for each spectrum. And what that then allows us to do is put these different spectral observations into different groups. So what I chose to do was produce four different groups. So the northern magnetic phase, I should point out, it ranges between zero degrees up to 360 degrees, okay? So I've decided to split this range into quarters. So in the first quarter, we've got the data centered on zero degrees. Second quarter, we've got sent a data center on 90 degrees and so on, 180 degrees and 270 degrees as well. So we've got four different groupings. We're taking the spectra and then we're putting them into one of these groups depending on what their magnetic phase is. And that is something that we can work out using Cassini magnetic field measurements. And this just gives a breakdown of the number of spectra that ended up in each of these groupings. Okay, let's leave that for a moment and look at how we then derive the intensity and the velocity. So emission intensities and the velocities of these H3 plus ions, which is the key thing that we're looking at here. So the emission line, as I showed you earlier, the Q1 line, for instance, or the R2 line in each spectrum can be combined to produce a map of the total emission from the planet. And that there at the bottom is something that I showed you earlier. So we've got the emission line data and we've combined that data into a map, okay? These maps can then be used to work out what, how bright the aurora are and indeed how fast or slow the uh, ions are moving in the upper atmosphere. So I'll just zoom into this using my mouse, okay? We've got, from the previous slide, I mentioned we've got four different groupings. So this is one, there's another, we've got another, and then the fourth one's down there. Okay, so for each of these, I've produced the map of auroral emission intensity, how bright the aurora are, that you can see in orange, and then the blue and red maps, those are the ones which are showing us the velocities of these ions. And then the plot on the right-hand side is the average of both of these different maps, okay? Um, so just looking at this on its own, I guess there isn't really uh, much that we can point out. It's fairly standard based on what we've seen in the past, but the real interesting thing comes when we start combining these maps, okay? And comparing opposite groupings of magnetic phase. So um, what we're doing here now is we are taking these maps and then averaging them, okay? If we look at the groups that are opposite to each other, so if we're looking at zero degrees of magnetic phase and comparing that with 180 degrees, similarly 90 degrees versus 270, what that allows us to do is pick out the ion flows that are linked to the planetary electric currents, which I mentioned earlier, okay? So subtracting the velocities and then averaging them produces this map here, okay? So this is now an average of the emission intensity and an average of the ion velocities of H3 plus, okay? Again, this is, this is where we really start getting into cool science because we're seeing something now that we've not seen before. Behavior linked to the planetary period currents, the currents, the electric currents that are thought to be responsible for the changes in rotation rate. Okay, one last step. We've got these maps now. There it is again. We've combined our maps shown in B and E into one fully blown vector map, okay? And this now allows us to compare directly with theoretical predictions. So, you know, just the visual inspection on its own, you should be able to tell uh, our observations, what do they match up with? I think you'll find it's the atmosphere, okay? So what that then suggests to us is that the atmosphere, there's a mechanism, i.e. this twin vortex that we've seen in Saturn's upper atmosphere that is responsible for the changes in 
planetary rotation rate, the changes in radio emission um, signal that we get from the planet, and indeed across the entire planetary system at Saturn, uh, we see these periodicities and these changes in time. Okay, and that, that, that's that's pretty cool. Um, I remember when I was I was talking with, about this with my supervisor at the time uh, a few years ago, working on this, and uh, Tom said to me, "You know what, Nahid? You know what this means." There's only two people in the world that know the answer to the question that's been asked for several years, and it's us two, basically. And that just felt like such a profound moment, okay? So uh, the key results then from this study, we have found that there is a twin vortex in the upper atmosphere of Saturn that is responsible for driving the changes that we see in the rotation rate of the planet. And that's done because you've got these twin vortices they are having an effect on the electric currents, which then um, have an impact on radio emission that we measure from Saturn to determine the rotation rate. The other thing that we find is that local atmospheric weather effects, i.e. winds, okay, in the planet's upper atmosphere, they are capable of generating some of the aurora that we see at Saturn. And this is a completely new form of aurora creation mechanism that we've never seen before. And we're calling it the weather-driven aurora, okay? In the past, we've always thought that the aurora are created because you've got energetic charged particles from outside the planet coming in, reacting with neutral atoms and producing emission. Turns out now that maybe, well, in fact, it, it we have shown that there are local weather effects which can also create the aurora, okay? And lastly, it suggests that the radio emission that we've used in the past to measure the rotation rate of a planet, it's slightly subject to change, okay? And so that's something that we'll have to keep in mind going forwards. Um, I'll just quickly show this clip. This is something that uh, my collaborator produced. So this result, it created some, it generated some decent press interest. So the likes of uh, The Independent, um, AGU, Forbes, and uh, other news outlets picked this up. And this became quite big in February of this year. And this is a graphic that my collaborator produced, James O'Donoghue from Japan. Um, and it, it just shows what's going on and the image that we think is uh, prevalent now for Saturn. Okay, right. We're very nearly at the end. I'll try and put this result now into some context. So what does the result mean for the field, uh, the planetary? study of planetary science, uh, sorry, planetary science, let's just say. So first and foremost, it answers one of the longest standing questions in planetary science. Why does the length of a day on Saturn change over time? Well, we've now found that there is a twin vortex in the upper atmosphere of Saturn, which is driving changes in the electric currents that we see at the planet, which then has an impact on the radio emission that we are able to observe, okay? Um, it has led to a discovery for a new type of aurora, i.e. the weather driven type, which is excellent, you know, really exciting, something that we've never seen before, um, but we have now. And this result will have ramifications for the future study of aurora on exoplanets. So these are planets which orbit other stars other than the sun. Um, what does this result mean for me in a personal sense? Well, it is the defining result of my PhD, okay? so. I've worked on three different studies, three different data chapters. Uh, the first one was published. The second one is this result. And then the third one is, has, hasn't been published yet. But this has been the main result of my PhD. Um, it was a very long journey. Okay, It did take a long time to get to this point. I started working on this data back when I was working at the Royal Observatory um, in 2019. So that's when I really got my hands uh, on this data to begin with. So it's taken three years basically to get to this result, but it does feel immensely satisfying knowing that we've managed to address one of the longest standing mysteries um, in the field. Um, however, it's not the end of the story. We now need to try and understand what drives this twin vortex in the first place. It's all well and good knowing that it's there. Uh, how does it come about? You know, what, what's causing it? So there's a lot more science to come. Um, and so I guess, yeah, just watch this space. That's all I had for you. Thank you ever so much.